we need to think about health outcomes. And I think I would always sort of caution uh, there that health outcomes take an awful long time to, to, to change. So we need to be very wary of looking for um, data that will demonstrate a sort of quick evidence of quick fix that we've managed to achieve things. And sometimes user satisfaction and use of services are better measures than health outcomes. We could also think about further demands on services. One of our goals might be to increase demands on other services as, for example, men became more used to using the services that are provided. One measure of success might be in sort of the ways in which that then spreads out to participation in other kinds of care, particularly preventive health care. There are other organisational approaches, and I just want to say um, a couple of things about, um, about these. Gender impact assessment is a tool, and it tends to be produced as a toolkit that is relatively um, sort of straightforward in terms of guiding the, the process and assessing the gender impact on, uh, of various kinds of interventions. But I want to say a bit more about gender-specific health outcome targets, the ways in which we might be more strategic in using health outcome targets. We live in a targeted world. We know that our public sector, my, my sector, the university, your sector, is driven by targets. These are becoming more and more significant. And yet we fail to use those targets that we have, public service agreements, heat targets in Scotland, or the quality and outcomes framework, we don't always use those in the way we can to actually try and achieve gender-specific outcomes. If we gender the targets, so with the COF targets, which give GPs points for achieving specific outcomes, if we gendered those targets in relation to obesity, making sure GPs were therefore aware of differences between women and men and therefore targeted um, their populations differently, we might be able to achieve change. The other thing that's significant, of course, is health information. And again, this has already been mentioned. And I think that we, can't, uh, we can never ignore this. There's a, huge, a hugely important need for gender disaggregated data. We need data that is routinely collected, is available at all levels. We need data on need as well as service use. And I think that's incredibly important, that we know that we are meeting certain, um, certain kinds of needs, but we don't always know the needs that are unmet because they're not voiced, they're not brought forward. So we need good gender disaggregated data on that. Um, we also need data, and I think it's interesting what you were saying about, we actually have a lot of data, and that's been my experience with the NHS in England as well. There is masses of data. What we don't have is that data routinely being produced for the users, people like yourselves, in the way that you would like it. We don't have that data being routinely given that measures those gender differences in the things that you would like to be measured so that you can tell your baseline points and then you can tell how far things have changed. And that data has to be capable of being disaggregated by other aspects of difference, by other influences. So we have to have data that is robust enough that we can break it down and talk about specific age groups, specific ethnic groups, specific other groups, so that we can tell how far gender differences are also interacting with others. That means we need big data sets. The WHO, the World Health Organization, has constructed an argument around health indicators, and I think it's worth mentioning them. This, these are not necessarily designed to be new data. What the WHO is trying to do with health indicators is to see if there are ways in which we can put together existing data sets. There may be an argument for some new data that has to be collected fresh, but that will combine to produce a more clear and a more um, sort of powerful picture of differences between men and women that will also be regularly and routinely available so that we can use a set of indicators on a regular basis to assess change. And they suggest that they, these health indicators should be about three things. They should be about health status, so the ways in which we might define our own health, things like our symptoms, the extent to which we have self-reported depression, self-reported other kinds of health problems. Gender differences in the social determinants of health. The WHO is strongly believes, and I think I do too, that we can't ignore the fact that our health is also impacted on by those social determinants. And we need to collect data of differences between women and men in those influences. And we also need data, better data, on differences in the performance of health systems. How well do health systems meet our needs and how well do health systems satisfy our, our needs? And that may be health outcomes, but it might also be whether we're treated with respect, whether we feel that our needs were met in an appropriate way, and so on. 
And health indicators are useful as long as they are regularly collected, but also as long as they are meeting the needs of user groups, as long as they are um, developed in consultation with key stakeholders, people like yourselves, who know what kinds of health indicators you might find useful in terms of trying to develop strategies. Okay, so what are the barriers? Um, sadly, I think we always need to kind of remember these. Um, there's often an argument about why do we do this? Why do we do gender equality? Why would we want to do that? And I think it often divides into two categories. On the one side, on the one hand, we have the, the social justice argument. We look at gender equality in terms of social justice, in the same way as we look at other aspects of inequality and we strive towards other equality goals, it's about justice in our society. But there's also, on the other hand, and this is used quite a lot, particularly in international policy-making arenas, the efficiency argument, that it is more efficient and we make better use of our resources if we are aware of gender differences and if we are strategic in the ways in which we address those, that we then don't waste resources in meeting health needs inappropriately or failing to challenge and tackle and deal with and address people's health differences because people aren't coming forward. So I think we need to bear in mind when we look at barriers that there's two arguments we can use, and one is justice, but the other one is efficiency, the business case. Mm. The barriers are, I'm sure, well known to you all. We need training. Training has to be provided at all levels, and that requires um, resources. We need um, a shift in organisational culture. Um, Amartya Sen, who's a writer, um, an economist who writes a lot about international inequalities in health, talks about plaque, that there's plaque in the organisation, that kind of institutional plaque that stops change. And I think it's quite mm. a graphic but quite a powerful explanation. And it's very difficult to work out how to get around that. We need political commitment. This has to be something, and particularly as it's been brought in through legislation, it needs to be maintained through political commitment. That's either at the large government scale, but it's also down through local organisations. We need time. We need to recognise it takes time. We need to know that we can't achieve all of these things at once, and sometimes that means prioritising. And we need to recognise the additional costs and resources that are involved. How will we know when we've got there? Just very briefly, um, if we take the obesity example, clearly women and men, neither of those constitute the gold standard. Women, uh, more women, women are more likely to be overweight or obese than to be what's defined as a normal or um, appropriate weight. Women often diet for appearance reasons. We don't necessarily diet for the right reasons. We don't always necessarily do it in the right way in terms of um, eating more fruit and vegetables. We know the rules, but we don't necessarily do it in the right way. There are health costs associated with weight cycling, with yo-yo dieting. Um, I've seen evidence that suggests that yo-yo dieting is, is worse for your health than being slightly overweight. That continual going backwards and forwards between different levels of weight. Um, and smoking, for, particularly amongst young women, is often used as a, as a weight control method. It's clearly not a gold standard to see either men or women as achieving the right kind of approach to obesity. What we need is a gender-sensitive approach. What we need is to identify and address gender differences in the causes, in the ways in which we recognise the problem, in the barriers that all of us have mm -hmm. to change. We've got to recognise the ways in which it's also associated with other kinds of inequalities. And policies that might come out of that approach could include, for example, very gender-specific public health promotions, public health activities, thinking about how we address men and women differently. And also gender targets for health professionals. Um, so, for example, the COF targets that I've already talked about, if we gender them, we may enable GPs. The, the studies tend to show that GPs are much less likely to say to men, hang on a minute, I'll weigh you, and we'll see, you know, we just need to talk about this, than they are to women. Both, both male and female GPs are more likely to see that as a problem for women than for men. That gender stereotyping mm -hmm. goes all the way through mm -hmm. society. Okay. What do we need? I'm sorry about this pie chart. I think it's sort of it's pie in the sky. It's so optimistic, and I don't know how realistic it is. But what we need are all of these things, and I think they're all equally important. We've got to have leadership. We need ownership amongst everybody who's doing it. We need training and resources. We've got to evaluate what we do, and we need accountability, because without accountability, we don't, we don't continue the, the, the move forward. So to end, leadership is essential. This is a quote from um, two writers who've written a lot about the European Union and gender mainstreaming. If gender is everybody's responsibility in general, then it's nobody's responsibility in particular. And I think that probably is quite a sort of, you know, that, that's a, a nugget that is worth hanging on to.